This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Roots and All. This week, I'm chatting with New England based horticultural therapist and master gardener Eric Keller, who's also the author of the book A Therapist's Garden Using Plants to Revitalize Your Spirit. Over 20 years, Eric has worked with thousands of people of all ages and types, using horticulture and therapeutic techniques to help them deal with physical, emotional and mental challenges. Eric talks about using an outdoor space as a place for therapy and learning, and about the downs and ups of bringing horticulture into people's lives as a way to heal. I began by asking Eric about his background. The interesting thing is that in terms of my background, I actually went to university as an engineer and wound up as a journalist, which is a whole different type of story and a different type of book. In terms of horticultural therapy and how I wound up in it, what I wound up doing was I was able to form a consulting business where I had a reasonable amount of free time. And I noticed that there was a master gardeners program in the state of Connecticut which I decided to sign up for, which I had the flexibility in my work schedule to go and attend. And the first thing I wound up doing is that you have to do a project with a various type of community group. And my first project wound up refurbishing a greenhouse at a girl's basically prison. It's a juvenile detention center for girls between the ages of 13 and 18 in the prejudication stage of going to court. So these were girls who were basically in a very prison-like setting, and they had this greenhouse that they didn't know what to do with. And I came in and basically showed them how to propagate plants and grow flowers, and we cleaned up things. And it was remarkable in how it changed their perspective of their captivity to a degree, their life. I mean, they became different people when they started to work with flowers and in the greenhouse. So I did that as part of my master gardening certificate and I received it. Flash forward a few years, my wife started to take courses at the New York Botanical Gardens in botanical illustration. And one day I looked at one of the catalogs she had in the back and in it, they had a discussion of certification in horticultural therapy and everything just clicked. I thought about my prior experience working with these young girls and it just seemed to be the right thing to do at the right time. So I started taking courses at the botanical gardens in all sorts of things that relate to gardens, as well as various types of therapies and different types of client bases, how to create a program. And I received my certification. And one of the first things, one of the hundred hour internship with a school that dealt with at-risk children called Green Chimneys in Brewster, New York. And I extended that and turned out I worked there for about three years on a part-time basis and worked with a wide variety of children whose experiences, some of which are in my book. So that's really kind of how I got started in it. And then I expanded it to other venues and client bases. What I like about the book is that you are obviously very hands-on and it sort of spoke about specific examples of your work. And I'd quite like to get into the nitty gritty of the actual sessions, if I may. It was really interesting how you work with scent in the garden. I thought I would ask you, first of all, what you have found are the most therapeutic and or stimulating plant scents for people to work with. It's really interesting because it can have very different effects on different clients. I'll give you two very different examples. So there was one time where a gentleman came in, we were doing a class on making sachets. And he came in, he had just lost his wife to cancer and he was looking for, you know, solace and just sort of different things to do. So we're passing around various herbs and he starts and stops with lavender, which it turned out was his wife's favorite scent. And he started, you know, stroking it. And then all of a sudden he got all teary and it just reminded him so much of his wife. And in fact, he never came back. That's not really the kind of emotional outbreak that I look for. Flipping this on a different way, one of the things that I found was that there was a woman, perhaps a few years later, she was undergoing cancer treatment. She was very pale. She had a kerchief on her head. 
So she comes into class. And again, it's another class where we're dealing with aromatic herbs and the herbs are being passed around to her. And she suddenly starts to smell some of the herbs and she alights with pleasure. She says this is the first time she's ever been able to smell for a year or two. It was a transformative experience for her. So it's just amazing. And she just was like happy and incredibly elated the whole time because she was able to do something that she hadn't been able to do for years. We have classes typically between 10 and 15 clients a sitting. So again, it's just sort of this wonderful transformative experience. And I planned the gardens around Ann's place, which is the cancer facility, which I manage right now as the horticulturalist and horticultural therapist. And part of my design of the grounds was to create a wide variety of aromatherapy spots that you can go to. So whether you're in the front, back, or side, there's always a plant that you can touch and you know impart its horticultural oils on to your hand and smell what it's like. And so there's literally a surprise around every corner for clients, which when we go for walks, I point out to clients that they should you know take advantage of. What I thought was interesting as well was you obviously try and make a connection between growing plants and eating. And I wondered why that might be important and whether it's more important for some sets of clients than others. I think the thing that I try to do in classes is you want to try to engage all the five senses because you never really know what senses are impaired or not. And taste things, some are only able to see or hear certain stuff. So, you know, for instance, At different times of the year, I like to pull out surprises. So for instance, there's a tree called the American redbud. And one of the things is that the flower is very flavorful. In the spring, I go foraging and I collect the makings of wild salads from things you can literally find growing in your backyard. And again, the clients are just amazed about how flavorful it can be and how surprising it is that for these things that most people call, you know, weeds, you can get a very flavorful, delicious, and incredibly nutritious salad. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting how you get people to taste their way around the garden. That's obviously such a good way of getting them to connect with it. But one of the things I've noticed was that sometimes you work with people who maybe lose their attention on the task in hand. And I wonder what techniques you use to bring them back to the task at hand and to keep them concentrated. I think you have to do a variety of things. And, you know, that was very much a function of my working. Well, it's working with a couple of different client bases. Sometimes you have that issue when you work with clients who have dementia, elderly clients. And it was often an issue when I was working with at-risk children. And so there's sort of different techniques you have to use. With the children, sometimes you have to try to do things in a different order to make them think about it in a different way. So rather than a certain row where you may have something that goes one, two, three, maybe you change it as three, two, one, so that they will think that they're doing something different and won't become bored with it. Other times you may switch tasks. So let's say instead of them digging a hole, digging a half inch hole and separating them every inch or so with a stick and then having me give them a seed that they can plant, maybe we switch roles. So maybe I'll do that and then they'll hold the seeds. With elderly patients with dementia, it can be a little more challenging because what you're trying to do is you know tickle the neurons so that they make a connection. And so you just have to try a bunch of different things and different approaches to it so that you can get through to the client. And also, I noticed that some people exhibit undesirable behaviors in the gardens. And I wondered, again, how you dealt with that, the techniques you can use to discourage that sort of behavior. It's funny because you get that in all sorts of client bases. Sometimes you'll have clients who, you know, if you're working with a large group who will want to sort of linger and just focus on a certain area. And with that, you try to bring them back to the group or what you'll do is say, okay, we'll come back to that later. And oftentimes that works with children. What you have to do is try to divert their attention to something different and not have them focus on what they want to focus on. So if they start becoming frustrated with a certain activity, you don't pound away and say, okay, look, you have to do this. Or if you don't do this, we're not going to be able to do that. You distract them and you try to work with them in a different way. 
So let's say if somebody's becoming frustrated, digging a hole because they don't feel like they're making any progress, you can maybe help them a little bit to dig the hole, or you look to dig the hole potentially in a different place, or you give them a different type of job to do. Sometimes they just need to step away. Sometimes you say, hey, why don't you just do me a favor? Can you go over there? And I need a pair of gloves. Could you go get me the pair of gloves? And so just sometimes that simple distraction, which will be a minute or two out of the activity, is enough to make them sort of reset their emotions and then you can get back on track. Yeah. And that is another thing that struck me. I thought you go into these lessons, you've obviously planned them meticulously. And then all of a sudden it just goes out the window because you've had to be flexible. If you do have to sort of switch stream halfway through, can you still keep your lesson outcomes in mind? Often you can. I mean, part of this is just experience. I mean, I surmise I'm probably much better at this now than I was when I was starting out. But whenever you come into these activities with a variety of client bases, you always have to have a couple of activities in the back of your brain as to what you're going to do. Because if you don't, every day that you will deal with, let's say, half a dozen clients or more, something is going to go south. You have to assume that just because either the tool's not available or the client is in a different kind of place or you have weather issues, something's going to change. So you have to be flexible. But the good thing is that, as you know, in the garden, there's never just one thing to do. (laughs) There's often many things to do. So you have a sort of an a priori list of this is the thing I'd like to do, but if I can't do this, I'll do that. And if I can't do that, I'll do this. And so you sort of go down the list, keeping in mind what's the best type of activity for the particular client at hand. So thinking about using the garden as a classroom, I noticed that you have expanded your work to be year round. How do you do that? How do you use it in all seasons? Well, I mean, that's the funny thing. I initially thought, as your question somewhat applies, like, well, you know, once things stop growing, then you basically have to shut down. And what I found as a gardener and as sort of a a teacher is that there's actually things to do year round. Now, obviously we'd rather be out in the garden when it's nice and warm and harvesting blueberries and eating them and sitting down with a nice iced tea. But what you find out is that there is beauty in all seasons. There's an austere beauty in the winter when everything is dormant. There's things to do in the fall when you have to clean up and then certain things come out. So for instance, one of my favorite fall trees is a witch hazel. And the beautiful thing about a lot of the witch hazels is that they flower basically in the late fall, which is not something that you would typically see in New England. You typically don't see trees flowering in the late fall, but it's a type of tree that does. And so what you do is with all of these different things, you create sort of a palette of experiences to show people that, in fact, gardens can be alive. For instance, one of the things that we started, and as you can read in the book at Ant's Place, is we started a three and four season garden using tubes. So what that does is that allows us to harvest salads and carrots and all sorts of stuff well sometimes into the winter. And in fact, I've been pulling salads from our garden since basic, well, the last month and a half has been kind of dicey because the temperature has gotten down to, oh, in a couple of cases, uh, zero Fahrenheit, which I guess is what, minus 20, minus 15 C. So nothing's going to grow in a cold frame in that weather, but there are things that are going to winter over. So I have greens that I'll be able to start eating from my cold frame in the next month or so because they've been wintering over. So again, showing that to people like, you know, basically you can still grow a salad. You can still pull radishes. You can still take get carrots in January if you're clever and smart about it. Again, people are amazed by that. And again, it brings them into the garden versus saying, well, it's just time to put my feet up on a sofa and not think about the garden for another three months. I can see the benefits of physically getting out in the garden year round. But I did wonder as well whether witnessing the seasonal changes might help garden users to deal with their personal issues and relate their circumstances to the garden. Does that happen? Do you see that happening? Uh, Sometimes. I mean, one of the things that I've been doing in my Zoom classes is having everybody kind of reflect on what they like or what they don't like in the seasons. Right now, my clients are really wanting for spring to occur. I mean, they're tired of the snow. I mean, it's we're three weeks away from spring. And so they're really sort of tired of it. Though you have a few who say, you know, I like the cold weather. I like the austere beauty. I like going out to park. Nobody there and just a beautiful silence. 
So what I try to do is show that they all have value and beauty in certain ways. And you should open yourself up to appreciate that. Thinking about the therapy side of it, does it work for everyone or are there people who just can't engage with it, don't engage with it? Oh, absolutely. You have to at least have an indication that you want to do it. I mean, if you hate the idea of gardening and getting your hands dirty and being around bugs and stuff like that, you can't do it. It does take, you know, for again, certain populations like, you know, when I was dealing with at-risk children, they did have to have a degree of self-control. They had to make sure that they wouldn't turn a tool into a potential weapon, either on themselves or on others. And you know, one of the things that we had to do in dealing with that population, and when I also dealt with the young ladies in prison, is basically you have to make sure you count your tools. It's like, okay, I gave out six garden shears and I have to make sure I get six garden shears back because maybe somebody took it as a potential weapon. It's interesting when you're dealing with different client bases, the sort of things you have to do. It was funny because when I was dealing with some elderly patients and clients in a nursing home I was doing work with, for some reason, I never could keep all the scissors I gave out. For some reason, I would always lose one or two sets with every class I would do. And I don't think it was vindictive. I just think they saw these scissors and said, oh, this must be mine. And they put it back in their pocket or their purse. So, you know, I don't think there's anything horrible about that. It's just, you know, again, sort of the client base you're dealing with. I got the impression that it is an extremely rewarding job that you do, but also it has its challenges. So I wondered if you could just finish with what's one of the best aspects of your job and maybe what's the one thing that would make your job easier? The most rewarding thing is seeing the change in people. They just respond so positively and they're so joyful about being in the guard and working on a variety of projects. And again, it depends upon the client base you're dealing with, the kind of reward they take. For instance, in the girls' prison, the reward for some of the young ladies was the fact that they could actually grow plants and create a planter for, let's say, their mother. In Anne's place with cancer patients, it's experiencing something new and having control in a situation that they typically don't have any control with. And when you have a debilitating disease, you often feel as if there's no control in your life. So by having a positive gardening experience, you sort of take that back. You have control over something that's living and growing and thriving. And you may not feel that about yourself. So I think that's sort of the rewarding things where you see the positive change in people. If I could change things, what would I do? Well, you know, horticultural therapy is typically a very underfunded activity. So a little more money would help. So I wouldn't have to do as sort of much stuff on my own. I mean, I grow a lot of the herbs that I give to my clients. I mean, I just finished up an exercise where we're creating mason bee houses. And to do that, I had to go and cut a number of large PVC pipes into sections of houses. And then I harvested basically a trunk full of bamboo and cut them up into little tiny sections. So those could be the tubes for the mason bees. I spent the better part of Sunday afternoon doing that. So I think on that run, if I had a little more money, then maybe I could buy cardboard tubes versus going and scavenging for bamboo canes and cutting them up on my own. That's dedication. That is, Eric, definitely. I did say that would be my last question, but actually I wondered if you could maybe finish with your favorite moment or thing that's happened in the garden that kind of encapsulates why you do what you do? It's hard to pick a moment. If you'd like, I could maybe read one of the little stories from my book. Yes, please. Okay. So this is one of the last stories and it's about my mother and it's called Mom on Ice. An ice storm arrived the other day and it has been unusual in its persistence. Typically when such weather events occur, we receive a slight layer of ice that disappears as quickly as it forms around branches, along walks, and on fencing. But an unusual chill is causing this quarter-inch-plus coating of ice to remain for days, affording me time to appreciate its beauty. Everything on the ground is covered in an undulating sheet that crackles intermittently, sounding like dry cereal crunching in your mouth as I walk upon it. But no footprints remain behind me. The pointy, crystal green blades of grass continue to stand firm as with stalactites in an underground cavern. Once the streets and my driveway are clear, Juan and I drive over to see my mother at Ridgecrest, a nursing home at the Meadow Ridge Senior Community. 
We arrive just before lunchtime, and she is getting ready for the day. She gives us a big smile as the nursing aide combs her gray hair, making it neat. I didn't expect you today, she said. What a wonderful surprise. We would have come yesterday, but the ice storm kept us at home, I reply. What ice storm? Juan and I point to the window in her room, letting her see the rhododendron sagging under the weight of ice. Beyond is a white lawn that shimmers as the sun reflects on the icy crystals embedded on the surface. I can tell that my mother would like to see more. Comfortable in her wheelchair with a red plaid wool lap blanket keeping her warm, we wheel her out of the nursing area toward a hallway with large windows and a view of trees and bushes. Stopping in front of a glass double door, my mother is in awe. A weeping cherry has become a drooping crystalline figure with tiny shards of ice beneath it. A row of black chokeberries is topped with ice, while a nearby crabapple tree displays pendulous fruits encased in ice looking like tiny, jeweled red teardrops. It's so beautiful. I've never seen anything like it, says my mother. We sit and watch the light play with the plants. My mother doesn't want to leave the area, as the sparkling garden has her enthralled. Birds try to perch on the icy limbs of a nearby flowering dogwood. One comically slips off a branch a few times before it is able to get a firm grip. Pieces of fallen ice are scattered over the lawn, appearing as sparkling, albeit transitory diamonds. We eventually arrive at the atrium filled with tropical plants whose three-story high translucent ceiling is covered with ice. Suddenly, without warning, sheets of ice slide downward silently like marbles bouncing on the floor. Initially worried, my mother is calmed when we point out to her what is happening. She looks upward and then sees for herself the ice move. Next to her wheelchair, a small indoor waterfall splashes into a pond holding ornamental carp. The air is thick with humidity as the trees and undergrowth pump out oxygen. She takes in a deep breath, and a smile comes to her face. Can we have a cup of tea, asks my mother. You bet, I reply, heading off to fulfill her request. As I fill a cup for her, and I look back to see her with her head tilted toward the sky, watching and listening for the ice to fall. This was one of the last times I saw my mother alive before she succumbed to COVID-19 in spring. Hasn't there been a lot of sadness over the past couple of years? It's been said before, but thank God for gardens where many of us can find solace. Eric shows a stoic nature through his writing and his book is not at all downbeat, but there is clearly an undercurrent of sadness running through it, given the nature of his work and the situations the people he works with often find themselves in. But there's also much hope and a sense of spiritual enrichment that makes it uplifting. Thank you to Eric for being on the podcast and sharing the piece from his book about his mother, who's a central character in it. Thanks to you for listening too. Here's Dr Ian Bedford now, talking about protecting your plants from those bugs who might want to eat your harvest before you do. Alongside shrubs, trees and ornamental plants, many of Britain's 23 million gardens are perfect places for producing some homegrown fruit and veg. And with so many obvious benefits, it's certainly worth having a go if you're not doing it already. Particularly since nowadays, there's many varieties available that have been produced for different growing methods, particularly within a home garden. Whether it be in a pot or container, or in a large open bed. Without having any prior experience though, there's likely to be a few challenges to overcome. So it'll certainly be worth seeking a bit of advice on what the plants might need in regards to soil type, watering, feeding, and the level of sunlight they're exposed to. It'll also be worth finding out what creatures might consider your plants as their food, and how you might be able to protect your plants from the damage they cause. But realistically, that shouldn't be too difficult. Since homegrown produce will certainly be much simpler to keep an eye on than commercially grown crops, and so potential problems could be averted or dealt with more easily. So by recognising the creatures that we'll call the plant pests when they first appear, and knowing a little bit about their life cycles, we can decide on a suitable method for controlling them, which for homegrown produce will always have the option of being chemical free. So. Using cabbage as a good example, it'll attract many different pests that'll feed in different ways and on different parts of the plant, such as the leaf munchers, the butterfly moth larvae, 
leaf mining flies, and flea beetles, all of which could be blocked from accessing the plants with suitable nettings. And the sapsuckers, the aphids and the white fly that, although finer netting might block their access to the plants, infestations could be removed with a soap-based spray. But then there's the pests that can't always be seen, the ones that live underground and feed on the plant roots. And for cabbages, these will be the maggots of the cabbage root fly that hatch from eggs laid by adult flies around the base of the plants. Although netting might prevent the flies from accessing the plants, they could also be prevented from laying their eggs into the soil by placing a fabric disc called a cabbage collar on the ground around the stem of the plants, or by spreading a layer of non-absorbent substrate around the stems. So whether it's cabbages or any other homegrown fruits and veg, it's always going to be best to do a bit of research first on their potential plant pests. Then, as the proverb states, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.